on Sports Talk 790. Wex AC, Dan Matthews, the show killer, with you up until 6 o'clock tonight. And if it's early February and spring training hasn't gotten underway and we've got Jeff Blum on the phone, well, something huge happened. So, obviously, we wanted to get our buddy to come in and talk about uh, Altuve becoming an Astro for life. And as the man who has affectionately referred to him on broadcasts during games as adorable, you have to be particularly happy about this news. I am ecstatic, and uh, it's good to be on with you guys. And uh, this is something that I think we were all waiting for, and we finally got it. And I'm just I'm I'm elated about it because yes, I have said that he is adorable, <laughs> but he's also one of the best ball players I've literally ever seen play the game. So it's going to be exciting to see what he's able to accomplish uh, in the next six years when that contract starts next year, man. Did you kind of feel like this was, you know, you almost already mentioned it, this was a little inevitable, but did that add more inevitability when the Astros went out and said, hey, guess what about that window? We're keeping it open for another five Josh Hader years. Didn't it again just add more sense to, well, obviously we're going to bring Jose Altuve through all of it. Yeah, and you know what? I think that speaks volumes for Dana Brown and for Jim Crane because, like you're saying about signing Josh Hader, that's a that's a move that is actually saying, yes, we still believe we have the team that can go out there and score some runs, and we want to find a way to shut these games down at the back end. And you just, ex- you know, you basically shorten that game by easily three innings, if not more, if you can get a couple more outs out of an Abreu or a Presley, if not Hader. But at the same time, how do you keep that offense going? And the guy at the top has been the igniter for the last 12 years in Jose Altuve, and then he's putting up Hall of Fame-type numbers. And then you add all of the postseason accolades he's able to accomplish. So I think Altuve is in a great spot not only to be able to accrue regular season Hall of Fame-type numbers, But by the time it's all said and done, he may be writing himself at the top of a lot of record books in postseason, you know, statistical areas, too. But at the same time, I don't know how you guys feel about it, but he's kind of worked himself and played himself into the situation of you can't imagine him playing anywhere else but here. And thankfully, Jim Crane and Dana Brown came to the realization that they don't want that to happen. And they gave the Astro fans something to cheer for for the next five, six years, knowing that Altuve is going to finish as an Astro. Was there even the additional element of both, I can't imagine him playing anywhere else, and this is his team? Yes. And, you know, it's funny because you can hear all the vitriol online and social media that a lot of us see about Jose Altuve. And that's a lot of ignorance coming through in baseball fans. And I think it's out of spite because they know what Jose Altuve can do. And they know what they, what Jose Altuve's done throughout his career. And a lot of that is just hate because he's so good. And now we get to, you know, kind of perpetuate that hate towards him as he continues to go out there and frustrate the hell out of the rest of the league because he is so good at what he does. But the beauty of this, and I think you guys feel the same way as I do, he's ours. And I think he understands that, and he's really going to relish in the fact that he is going to retire an Astro someday. Five more years of F. Altuve chants in stadiums across the country mm. is just around the corner, and we look forward to that. Obviously, we're talking to Jeff Blum here on Sports Talk 790. And yeah, like, I, we haven't had you on since the hater news, and I know this is a day for Altuve, but since we've got you, um, mm-hmm. it's not just what you think of that deal, but what do you think? I think the, the clubhouse during this run has been so important for the Astros. And that's something that can be delicate when you're talking about Ryan Presley, not only being the closer firmly entrenched, but doing what he's done in that role. Now you've got a big dollar, big name guy coming in to presumably take that role from you. It's That's no small feat. How, as a guy who's been in clubhouses, do the Astros manage that so delicately before, during, and after this deal's announced? Um, I think it's a credit to the culture, but I also think it's a credit to, like you said, Dana Brown, Joe Espada, some of these guys inside that clubhouse. Uh, you know, I'm sure even, you know, Josh, uh, the pitching coach going in there and having the, the conversation saying, you know what, we have an opportunity. We are thinking about making this move. Would you be on board if we were able to do that? I, I would believe that they extended Presley, that, that, that professional courtesy, to have that conversation because the, the talks were headed that way. And at the same time, it's a true credit to Ryan Presta. I think he's one of the best and most professional guys in that clubhouse, both on and off the field with some of the stuff that he's done. And I think he understands in order to keep this window open and continuing to collect not only personal paychecks, but you're collecting, you know, playoff bonuses, you're collecting hardware, you're collecting rings. And I think that, you know, 
that might be an easy sell, but I also think it goes back to the culture that's created here in Houston with the fact that we are going to go out there and win. We're going to find guys who have that like-minded mentality to go out there and work their tails off to go out and make it happen. And uh, it's hard to argue when you hear, you know, if you're going to bring somebody in to take my position, why not have it be a guy who's probably one of the best in the league? So, I mean, that might be a little bit easier pill to swallow in the sense that it's Josh Hader instead of maybe somebody else that was marginal. This guy is legit. And this is a wipeout bullpen that already led the American League with 10 strikeouts per nine innings. And now throughout his career, Josh Hader's had 15 strikeouts per in, per nine innings. I mean, this this is a wipeout legitimate shutdown bullpen now. Is there anybody he reminds you of if you can visualize yourself in the box facing a pitcher so spindly and lengthy from the left side like he was? Well, if you if you take the the stature out of it, I mean, his delivery is very reminiscent of Randy Johnson. Kind of drops down a little bit at that three quarter arm angle, and the ball just comes jumping out of the hand in the upper nineties, and then a put away slider. I mean, that stuff wise, it's very similar. But uh, you know, the Astros have had a lot of success having a you know particular left handed pitchers out of their bullpen that throw ninety five to one hundred miles an hour to close out games. So one, the way that t- today almost had to go, because every time something major with Altuve happens, we, we, he gets asked to look back because he's one of the holdovers and one of the greatest from the time when this team wasn't winning at all and when there are 100 lost seasons going uh, consecutively over a three-year period. And he took it back even further, obviously, when he was just brought up and recounted the Astros telling him that they're, he's the temporary solution until they find a permanent second baseman. That was 2011. He's been the permanent second baseman ever since and will likely continue to do that uh, for the majority, if not all, of this contract. And I say all that uh, to ask you about the expectations to what turned out to be reality. I mean, the best players in Astros history almost were, you know, in Biggio's case, this was a top pick. He happened to be a catcher. The expectations that he would be very, very good were always there. Jeff Bagwell was blocked in Boston, although a very highly touted prospect. I don't know that they thought his career would be this great, but he was a player they figured would be very, very good, which is why they wanted him from the Red Sox. Altuve was none of that. And then he came to the minor leagues and started hitting and he's never stopped. So the expectations versus reality. I, I can't imagine, I wonder if you can, something being so grand like Altuve has produced. No, I think it's pretty much unfathomable. But at the same time, like you're talking about, if you, if you are raising a young athlete, if you're raising a young ball player, and maybe they don't have the stature or you know maybe the the strength that you think to play the game. Just go ahead and show them the example of Jose Altuve because that guy, just because of his stature, had been doubted since you know since his signing, since before his signing. You know, he, it took a lot of convincing just to get him, you know, stateside and put him in a uniform and let him go show what he can do. And it's a credit to Jose Altuve too, understanding that everything was against him, but he loved the game so much. He worked hard, and obviously there was this ingrained ability to get the barrel to the baseball and he never doubted himself for a second and here he sits you know with 2,000 plus hits later not and he's not a guy that's going to look back and say I told you so or laugh at you because you made the wrong decision he's just he's just continuing to go out and prove to himself that he's able to you know handle himself at this level at such an elite level for so long and I think that's where he drive, he gets a lot of that drive and a lot of that pride from going out there and proving himself right because he's had that self-belief for so long but a good story has now turned into a phenomenal story, and by the end of it, it's going to be pretty damn remarkable to look back on his career. And hopefully he's able to do that someday, too, is look back and go, damn, I, I did something pretty good and had a huge impact on a, on a great community here in Houston. Yeah, that good story has already become a legend, and so now it's just about kind of supplementing yeah. that legend. We're talking to Jeff Blum here on Sports Talk 790, and you mentioned the stature. Um, I have long thought, after the cheating scandal especially, that was the biggest reason why he gets so much vitriol. You could say he was the face of the franchise and all that kind of stuff, but there were so many stars. I always thought it was because he's a little guy that just kicked everybody's ass every single time he played them, and that's why he got the vitriol that he did. But aside from that, there's really only one thing left for him to do other than add to the hardware as far as championships go, and that's chase down what Craig Biggio did late into his career. Um, I know he didn't exactly get any help from that broken thumb this past uh, season, uh, but this guy can get it done, especially with the type of prolific hitter that he is. 
uh, as a guy that played with Biggio, as a guy who saw so many of those hits, there's nothing other than injuries that will likely get in the way of that. You think he's definitely going to get 3,000? Yeah, I mean, just understanding, you know, his drive and his ability, you know, he can rack up hits, you know, at a, at a monumental rate, at a monumental rate. And the fact that, you know, I keep saying barrel to ball skills, that's something that kind of tells me that he's going to have the ability to continue to go out there and find ways to get hits. And, uh, the health is going to be the one thing because the more games you play, the more opportunities you're going to create. And obviously he's going to get more hits. The one thing that I'm kind of interested about is that he's relied on speed to get a lot of these hits, too. How long does that speed stay with him? And I think that's what's interesting about last year is, yeah, he missed some games, didn't get the numbers that he wanted to, but was still able to play at you know, championship caliber uh, type level and go out and get the hits. But he looked great. He looked physical. He looked like he was still moving like he has in the past. And once you see that step start to to uh, elude him a little bit, that's where you might draw a little bit of concern, but that's where he has the ability to rely on the fact that he's such a good hitter because his hand-eye coordination is unrivaled. His, ab- his ability to move the ball around the, the ballpark is unrivaled. And we've seen kind of the evolution of Altuve where he was a guy that could spray the ball, find hits, and go out there and get the batting average, get the on-base percentage. And then all of a sudden, once he realized that he was able to go out there and get those hits, what did we start seeing him do? He started to hit tanks all over the place, and now he's got, you know, 20 home run a year power. And that's where I think it's kind of going to be kind of fun to see where he evolves moving forward at the, and when this five-year contract kicks in, because I feel like he has the ability to go out there and do anything he wants with that stick. Certainly feel like you led me down here to, to send you out the door. Saying all that... I feel like you've made it inevitable that the answer to this question will be yes. At around 3.16 p.m. on March 28th, after Justin Verlander sets down Arson Judge and the Yankees 1-2-3 in the top of the first on opening day at Minute Maid Park, right here on Sports Talk 790 and Space City Home Network, Jose Altuve will step to the plate around 3.16. He is hitting the first pitch from Garrett Cole out of the park for a homer on opening day. (laughs) Yes or no? Well, that's that's after he has enough time to uh, let the crowd settle down after the ovation that he is going to get on opening day now that everybody's going to recognize he's going to be here for the rest of his career. And then I would love, absolutely love to hear TK call a home run after he steps on a Garrett Cole pitch. Train number 27 has left the station. Left the station. Go ahead and start building that monument outside and go ahead and put somebody in the rafters, start build, erecting that little... You know, something that's going to hold that number because 27 is never going to be worn by somebody else. What expletive is well, you Garrett knew that Cole going to say? Ago, didn't you? Nobody else would yeah. ever wear number 27. Yeah, I mean that's pretty well established. But you can go ahead and put something right next to Cheito's number or Cheo's number up there that, that's going to hold that baseball that says 27 on it. Just in case you were wondering, Wex has not gotten any less mean during the off season. Who am I being mean to? Jeff Blum, our guest, who what? wore 27. Oh, I didn't know that. Dude, I'm a trivia question now. <laughs> what answer? I'm a trivia answer now. Who was the last guy to wear 27 before Altuve, man? This like, guy's doing me favors. I like that trivia question about Astros lore better than your other one. Yeah, uh, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Blummer. Me, the, me and Kurt Gibson go way back. Ah, uh, you. You. Yeah. All right. We'll be talking to you soon. Appreciate hey, you. I'll, uh, I'll massage you next time I get next to you. It's okay. Aw, uh, look at the bromance staying alive. I love it. <laughs> All right, Blummer, uh, we will catch up with you when the season gets underway, as we always do. Enjoy your time off. We know you've earned it, and uh, we'll talk to you very soon. No, I'm looking forward to it, man. I can't wait for the season to start. Thanks, fellas. Absolutely. Jeff Blum here on Sports Talk 790, Space City Home Network, friend of the show, and an all-around fantastic American.